Greetings, my fellow Christians. I am Lemuel Haynes, and today I stand before you, a pioneer ordained as the first black minister of the gospel in colonial America during the 17th to 18th centuries. My journey began in West Hartford, Connecticut, where I was born to a father of African descent and a white mother. Abandoned as an infant, I was placed in a home in the care of a reformed Christian family, led by Deacon David Rose, a blind farmer from Granville, Massachusetts. This remarkable family embraced me as their own, treating me as a son rather than an indentured servant. Under their roof, I received a precious education, immersed in the teachings of the Bible and the doctrines of grace. Church became the center of my life, where I was introduced to the godly works of preachers like Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, and Philip Doddridge, whose influence left an indelible mark on my faith. I must extend my heartfelt gratitude to Mrs. Elizabeth Rose, who, in the absence of her husband, took it upon herself to nurture and guide my upbringing. Her unwavering devotion was nothing short of extraordinary, and she cared for me as if I were her very own child. Neighbors often remarked on her exceptional attachment to me, suggesting that her love for me exceeded even that of her own children. Such was the depth of her care and affection for my well-being. During my youth, I experienced a holy conversion to faith in Jesus Christ. I wrote many years later, it was reliance on the merits of the Savior that supported me. Had I a thousand souls, I would venture them on Him. At the age of 21, my indenture came to an end, and I embarked on my journey as a free man. In 1774, my fervor for the cause of freedom led me to join the Minutemen of Granville. The following year, upon hearing news of the battles of Lexington and Concord, I marched with my militia company to Roxbury, Massachusetts, in 1776, I had the honor of accompanying them to the garrisoning of the recently captured Fort Ticonderoga, where we stood in defense of our expanding nation. My dedication to duty remained unwavering until I contracted typhus, a grave illness that compelled me to return home. Even though my indenture had technically concluded by that point, I found myself drawn back to the Rose Homestead. My brief but impactful service in the Continental Army deepened my understanding of new divinity theology and republican ideology. This knowledge became a significant influence on my later writings and advocacy for pro-black and anti-slavery causes. I steadfastly believed that the revolution could not be considered complete as long as the stain of slavery persisted in our nation, and I continued to champion the cause for years to come. In 1785, I reached a pivotal milestone in my spiritual journey when I was ordained in the Congregational Church. For three years, I served as a pastor in Torrington, Connecticut, tending to the spiritual needs of my congregation. In 1788, I accepted a divine call to shepherd the West Parish Church of Rutland, Vermont, now known as West Rutland's Church. For the subsequent three decades, I dedicated myself to this community. My path eventually led me to a temporary pastorate in Manchester, Vermont, and later to South Granville, New York where I served as the pastor of the South Granville Congregational Church. Throughout my life, I held steadfastly to my convictions, tirelessly striving for equality and justice for all, regardless of their background or heritage. Historians have dubbed me the first black Puritan due to my unwavering commitment to the Reformed faith and the doctrines of grace. To be mentioned alongside great theologians like Jonathan Edwards humbles me deeply. It is with this background that I have been asked by a Puritan's mind to speak to you, albeit briefly, on the value of sincerity in true religion. Allow me to take a moment to encourage you, both preachers and hearers of the Word, to what is most valuable in this life as it pertains to preaching and hearing the Word of God. There is no denying that the gospel of Jesus often faces prejudice, and those who defend it encounter contempt. While we, as ministers of the Word, are but frail and sinful individuals like all others, we bear the weighty responsibility of delivering a divine message. Scripture implores us to esteem such messengers highly in love for their work's sake. As watchmen over souls, we understand the potential for neglect and inattention to the spiritual well-being of others. Sadly, as it was in my time, and perhaps even more so in yours, there are those who enter the ministry for self-satisfaction or mere employment alignment with their ideals. This is not what you need. The Church requires faithful men who are grounded in sound doctrine, guided by the Word of God, and ready to defend the truth. The Church needs spiritual leaders who model fidelity and love for God. 
those who will pour themselves out for the benefit of the Lord's sheep, like you. The office of gospel ministers implies a spiritual battle, a controversy, and impending danger. It calls for shepherds who do not care for mere temporal concerns, but focus solely on the spiritual well-being of souls. These ministers watch for souls and are gifts to the church from the Lord. They must be faithful, diligently seeking to please God above all else. Their preaching should not aim to gratify the carnal heart, but to declare the whole counsel of God. Their discourse should not entertain with empty speculations or vain philosophy, but focus on matters concerning eternal welfare. Jesus Christ and His sacrifice on the cross must remain the central theme of their preaching. Like skillful physicians, they must lead their patients to recognize their spiritual maladies and point them to the bleeding Savior as the only path to recovery. As I reflect on my own life, a significant portion was devoted to the service of ministry. While I acknowledge a myriad of imperfections in my ministry, I can genuinely say that it was my earnest desire to contribute to the salvation of souls. In your time, when churches often compromise more than they teach the standards of sincere religion, you need more faithful preachers who are firmly convicted of the truths of Christ Jesus, men who understand the divine glory of Christ and strive to display His holy character through sound preaching in the best method. This has been God's design from the beginning, to draw men's attention to Himself by His Word. This pursuit continues today, and will continue to persist until Christ returns. There is no greater calling this side of heaven than to rescue souls from the clutches of death and hell and proclaim God's covenant salvation to a perishing world. But my friends, as ministers preach, so too must you listen with unwavering commitment. As ministers must give an account for their preaching and conduct, so must you be examined in how you hear and improve the word. The church needs sincere Christians in the pew, stalwart beacons of divine and supernatural light, dedicated to Christ unwaveringly. And if we have preachers to proclaim these glorious truths of grace and covenant mercy with unyielding conviction and unwavering steadfastness, it is equally imperative that those who listen do so with the same fervor. Just as ministers are called to give an account of how they preach and conduct themselves, so too are the listeners to be examined in how they hear and apply the word. We require sincere Christians in the pew, individuals who are resolutely devoted to Christ, no matter the circumstances. I implore you, my fellow believers, to stand firm in the Lord and draw strength from His mighty power, regardless of the temptations the world, the flesh, or the devil may present. Regardless of what names others may call you or false accusations they may hurl your way, seek refuge in the strong tower, the shield, and the buckler that is Christ. Let your life and your death resound with the same resolute faith. Reflect upon yourself and your life, recognizing that there is nothing within you or in all your deeds to commend you at the judgment seat of King Jesus. Christ is your all, and His blood is your sole hope of acceptance. Herein lies my desire to be of assistance to you. Your personal piety commences with a holy submission to God and a sincere friendship with Jesus. Be captivated by the love of Christ. Understand that when He hung on the cross, He had you in His thoughts, particularly as a sincere believer. I stand before you today, my dear friends and brethren, to earnestly plead with you to remain unwavering as believers and follow Christ, who sits upon the holy hill of Zion with pardon in His hands, atop His ark of mercy. Look to the past and see the blood shed for your sins. Look ahead to the days to come and plead the cleansing power of that same blood. Redeem the time, for these are evil days. Cling to the promises of God's word, drawing encouragement for your hope and trust in Him. Let your hearts be aflame with holy affections for the heavenly realms, where Christ reigns at the right hand of the Father. Pursue salvation with unwavering dedication, for it is a wondrous gift from God, the very force at work within us who believe. Being fortified by these truths, the manner in which ministers proclaim the word and how you, as a congregation, receive it, is a solemn commitment, as it carries the weight of death and judgment in view. This perspective makes preaching and hearing a grave matter, infusing the house of God with profound solemnity. We shall soon stand before the judgment seat of Christ, perhaps even before the next Lord's Day, where our sermons and our reception of the word will be scrutinized by the one who possesses infinite knowledge and is present in every assembly. If you maintain this awareness, it will help eradicate the coldness, drowsiness, and indifference that often accompany lazy preaching and lazy hearing of the gospel. It will dispel the formal spirit that can sometimes taint the hearts of listeners. I pray that such formality is not found among you. This perspective will curb frivolity of mind and disorderly behavior, preventing the presumptuous conduct that can sometimes occur in the house of God. 
The house of worship is indeed a place fit for the great king, a reflection suitable for all occasions, and particularly when we gather for public worship. I could share much more with you, but my time is running short. I leave you with a thought from Pastor Edwards, which has been a source of inspiration for me, and I hope it inspires you as we embark on these new days ahead. Resolved to strive to my utmost every week to be brought higher in religion and to a higher exercise of grace than I was the week before. Amen.